good evening. Some very interesting news notes this month. We had a supernova in M81. Now, M81, there it is, it's a spiral galaxy in Ursa Major, beyond our local group, but still one of the closest spirals. And here is a picture of the supernova taken by Ron Arbor, that rather bright thing over to the left-hand side. And we know exactly what it was. It was a Type II supernova, shining as its brightest at least 10,000 million times more powerful than our sun, and caused by the collapse of a very massive star. But it's a very odd one, because it seemed to have two maxima rising at its peak to about magnitude 10. And supernovae don't usually do that. And this is the brightest supernova we've seen for about 140 years, apart, of course, from the 1987 supernova in the large cloud of Magellan. But at the moment, it's very much of a puzzle. Coming much nearer home, I've had a very interesting picture sent to me by David Jewett and Jane Lua from the Observatory of Hawaii on Mauna Kea. Just look at this. This is all that's left of comet Shoemaker-Levy, which made the great mistake of passing within 30 million miles of Jupiter and was literally torn to pieces. And I think that's a graphic reminder that by cosmic standards, comets are very flimsy and ephemeral things. But David Jewett and Jane Lou have actually sent me another picture. I think it's even more interesting in a way. You see that blob right in the middle? That is the thing they call Kala, and that appears to be a very remote asteroidal object. We've been used to saying that the outermost objects in the solar system, except comets, are Neptune and Pluto, but in 1992, a more remote asteroidal body was discovered, and here is another. It appears to be something like 100 miles in diameter, possibly rather more, taking a long, long time to go around the sun, staying well beyond Neptune and Pluto, and is probably what we call a planetesimal, one of the building blocks left over, so to speak, when the main planets were formed, something like four and a half thousand million years ago. It may come from what we've come to call the Kuiper Belt, and there may be a whole swarm of these objects out there. We've got to wait and see. Anyway, we now know that the planetary system is rather larger than we've always been thinking. And now, on to my main topic. Over the past 36 years, I wonder how many letters I've had from older people who say, when I was young, I used to be able to see the stars, and now I can't see them nearly so clearly. What's happened to the stars? The answer is, of course, that nothing has. The stars are exactly the same as they always were. But our skies are not. Artificial lighting has increased, and we now have a problem of light pollution. Just look at this picture of the world. A certain amount of aurora lighting near the North Pole, certainly, but look at all the artificial light spread over the globe. And here's a night picture of the United States. You can see the problem there. And coming right near home, here's a picture taken at night of Durham taken by John Mason a little while ago. And when I was recently over in Ireland, I came outside Dublin, and I took that picture over the city. And you can see the amount of light pollution that there is there. Now, you may say, so what? What about light pollution? Well, there are several points about that. Obviously, to the astronomer, it really is a hazard. But it's more than that. It affects all everyday life as well. Because lights that shine upwards cost a great deal of money, I think it's estimated that at least 20 million pounds per year is wasted by lights that shine up and not down. And moreover, those lights are dangerous. Those horrible globe lights create pools of blackness at the bottom in which inside which wrongdoers can lurk. Also, they don't illuminate the ground properly. Now, let me stress that astronomers are not saying, put out the lights. We don't want to do that. You can't do that. What we are saying is that when existing lights have to be replaced, then please, replace them with modern type lights that shine down and not up. They'll do their job, and of course, incidentally, they will not interfere with astronomers. But there is a problem there. People are now very aware of it. And I've also been having letters from people who say, I live in the middle of a town or city. What can I do? What can I see in the sky? I can't see the stars at all. That's not entirely true. I quite agree that the town dweller is limited, but he can do various things. So in this program, I want to try and explain some of the things you can do from the town and some of the things you can't. And one thing, of course, you can't do is to see very faint objects, a deep sky observation, because the sky really is too light. And the first thing that happens is that you lose all but the brighter stars. Let me show you what I mean. Here's a photograph of Orion, one that I took myself quite recently from my home in Celsius. You can see the main pattern very clearly. Betelgeuse, top left, Rigel, lower right, and the three stars of the belt. 
and that's very distinctive. And you can see the fainter stars as well. But now let's give you some light pollution by brightening the screen, and you can see what happens. All but the very bright stars disappear. Well, Orion may not be a fair choice. It's a, it's a winter constellation, of course. We are now losing it in the evening twilight. But um, when you come to things such as the Summer Triangle, it's a bit more complicated. The Summer Triangle, remember, is made up of three bright stars, totally unofficial name, Vega in Lyra, Denim in Cygnus, and Altair in Aquila. But an unofficial name I gave on a Sky at Night program many years ago, and it simply caught on. And uh, the constellation patterns there are very distinctive. And here's a picture of the Summer Triangle area. Vega over to the right, Deneb to the left, Altair near the bottom. And you can see there, for example, the cross of Cygnus extending down to between Vega and Altair. But once you have a brighter sky, then all that is lost, and you're left only with the three main stars of the triangle itself. And that does make star recognition rather difficult. And frankly, from a town, there's nothing much you can do about that. Some people say, well, take your telescope onto a rooftop, or have a rooftop observatory. That's been done. It is quite definitely not a good idea. For one thing, it's only a question of time because before something gets dropped. I remember many years ago, having poked a telescope out of an open window, I dropped an eyepiece 30 feet on the concrete, and it did that eyepiece no good at all. But worse than that, you get shimmer. If you're on a roof, your house is going to be below you, and the heated air is going to rise, and that's going to destroy the seeing. We rigged up a demonstration here to show just what I mean. Here's a picture of the moon, nice and clear cut. Now we will give you some heat pollution. The heated air is rising, and you can see what is happening. The image is shimmering and shaking, and frankly, you're losing all the detail. And that's what's going to happen if you observe from a rooftop. What we've done here, of course, is to heat the air between the camera and the screen by putting a gas fire underneath. But the principle is exactly the same. So rooftop observatories, in my view, are out. The thing to do is to take your observatory as far away from your heated house as you possibly can. I've got several observatories back at my home. Here's my runoff shed for my 12 and a half inch reflector. And as you can see, it is well away from my house. So, deep sky observation is no good. Rooftop observation, frankly, is no good either. So what can you do? Well, you have got the sun. With the sun, light pollution isn't much of a bother. Of course, unsteadiness is. You can't get away from that. But nevertheless, even if you live in a polluted area, you can do very useful solar work. And I'm reminded of my old friend, Bill Baxter. There he is with his four-inch four inch refracting telescope. He is dead now, very sadly, but he had earned himself a great reputation. For most of his life, he planted tea somewhere out in the east, then came back home and decided to take up astronomy. But he lived in Acton, which is a very light polluted area, and he knew that night observation wasn't really very much good. So therefore, he became a solar observer, fitted up his observatory with that four-inch telescope, and proceeded to take splendid photographs of sunspots. And I think most observatories now have Baxter sunspot pictures. There's one of his pictures. Here's another lovely group of sunspots. And here's yet a third. You can see the granulations there, too. And Bill Baxter earned himself a very considerable reputation as a solar observer using a four-inch telescope from outer London. But there's a one point I must make here. This is a warning I have given before more times than I can count, but I don't apologize for doing it again because it is so vitally important. Through a telescope or binoculars, never look straight at the sun. If you do, you will focus the light and worse, the heat onto your eye and you will blind yourself. Unfortunately, some small telescopes are sold with things like that, sun caps. And they say, put the cap over the eyepiece and then look at the sun direct. Never do it. Those things are not safe. They can't give you full protection and they're always liable to splinter without warning. So if you want to use a telescope on the sun, the only sensible way is to use your telescope as a projector and project the image onto a screen as is being done there, actually with my five inch refractor stopped down to three inches. Of course, the sun is to some extent a variable star. A few years ago, there were many sunspots and spots groups. Now we're going down to minimum. There are spots around. There's a disk as I saw it a few days ago. And there have even been some fairly big spots. But I think in the next few years, we're going to have a fairly spotless period. It will be the end of the century before activity really starts to build up again. But sun observing is something you really can do, even if you're right in the middle of a city, provided you can see the sun at all. Then, 
What about the moon? Now, this picture of the moon was taken actually with a three-inch telescope, and it shows some of the dark waterless seas quite well. And the moon is a fascinating object. Let me show you one or two pictures, amateur ones, but very good ones, taken by Commander Hatfield with his 12-inch telescope. There on the right-hand side is the great crater Copernicus. You can see the Apennine Mountains stretching away, the Maris and the over the left. Here's another picture. <laughs> that crater to the right-hand side is called Julius Caesar. Not because Julius was an astronomer, he certainly wasn't, but because of his association with reforming the calendar. And here's another picture, again showing Copernicus. Now, the first thing to do when you're looking at the moon is to find your way around. And that's not quite so easy as you might imagine, because everything depends upon the changing angle at which the sunlight strikes the lunar surface. When the crater is near the terminator, that's the boundary between the daylight and the night hemispheres, the interior is filled with shadow, and the crater may be very conspicuous. Then over the next nights, the shadows lengthen, the shadows decrease as the sun rises over the crater. You see the interior, the central peak if there is one. And finally, when the moon is full, the sun's almost above the crater, and it may be very hard to recognize at all. And some prominent craters almost disappear near the time of full moon. So you have to learn how to do it. And what I did when I started observing the moon was to select various craters and then make sketches of them under various conditions of illumination. And that can certainly be done. A three-inch telescope is quite adequate. That's the one that I use myself. And even from a city, you can learn your way around the moon and enjoy yourself wandering in imagination among the lunar landscapes. Now we come to planets. And here things are a bit more limited, I'm afraid, but some things can be done. At the moment, our main planet in the evening sky is Jupiter find it very easily indeed. We can begin, as always, with Ursa Major, the great bear or prowl, follow the tail of the bear or the handle of the prowl, round until you pass through Arcturus, come down to Virgo, and there is Jupiter near the bowl of the Y. And you can't really mistake Jupiter. It's fairly high in the south after dark, and it's so very bright. And that's a general view of Jupiter made a few years ago. And you can see there the yellowish flattened disk crossed by cloud belts. And Jupiter, remember, has a gaseous surface and is always changing. That's the south of the top drawing, so the main belt is the north equatorial down below the middle. And above that, you can see the south equatorial, which is normally very prominent. But recently, Jupiter has been doing very odd things. The south equatorial belt actually disappeared for a time last year. And there's a recent drawing I made. You can barely see the south equatorial belt at all. And now, things are different again. The South Equatorial is coming back, and once again, we can see that strange thing, the great red spot. There, slightly to the left of center. <laughs> I showed that drawing to somebody a little while ago, and they said, well, the red spot looks as if it's the nose of a man's face. Can you see it there? Not sure that I can. Anyway, Jupiter is always changing, and um, even under bad conditions, you can see the main belts. You can also see the four bright moons, which are called Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. And there's a drawing made by Paul Doherty, which shows them. Those are the three dots in a line. The fourth dot, rather to the left of Jupiter and above it, uh, is uh, a background star. Now, these moons are big. Three of them are bigger than our moon, and the fourth one only very slightly smaller. They go around Jupiter in paths that are pretty nearly circular in different periods. Now, if we were looking at Jupiter from above one of the poles, we'd see the moon behaving rather like this. Of course, this is very much speeded up. The outer moon, Callisto, near the top of the screen now, that takes more than 16 days to go around Jupiter, so it's very speeded up. But nevertheless, that's what we would see. In fact, we see Jupiter almost edgewise on, the, the, the equatorially represented. And therefore, the moons are generally strung out in a straight line because they move in the same plane as the planet's equator. And they show all kinds of phenomena. They may go behind Jupiter and be occulted. They may pass into Jupiter's shadow and be eclipsed. They may pass in transit in front of Jupiter, or they may even have shadow transits in front of Jupiter's disk. And those phenomena can very easily be seen with any small telescope, and they are fascinating to watch. And that is something you can certainly do, even if you're surrounded by artificial lights. Next, Saturn. Now, Saturn, the second giant planet, is now way south of the celestial equator. And therefore, that does present problems. There's a drawing I made a couple of years ago, and the rings were then wide open, and you can see them quite clearly. They are not solid or liquid, 
They are made up of small icy particles, all spinning around Saturn like tiny moons. And in that sketch, you can also see the dark Cassini division separating the two main rings. And Saturn, like Jupiter, does have belts. You can see a belt there. So that was made a couple of years ago. Now, the rings are not always like that. They can be edgewise onto us, and they're turning edgewise on now. In 1995, Saturn will appear like this and you'll have a better view of some of the Saturn's moons, notably the largest one, which is called Titan. What about the other planets? Well, Mars is still there in the evening sky. Not very well seen now, I'm afraid, rather a wrong way away. Shows a phase in that drawing. And I think we are more entitled now to concentrate upon Venus. Now, there's a sketch of Venus I made a little while ago. You can't see any markings there. Venus is covered with a dense atmosphere, as we know, and it shows a crescent phase. Let me show you how those phases work. When Venus is more or less between us and the Sun, its dark face is turned towards us and we can't see it. Venus is new. Then, as it moves along, it becomes a crescent, as it is now. It then proceeds further along its orbit, and it becomes a half phase. Then further along still, a three-quarter or gibbous appearance. When Venus is full, it's on the far side of the Sun, and clearly you can't see it at all. But then the phases are repeated in the reverse order, Three quarters, half, crescent, and back to new. And these can be followed even by a city dweller with any telescope or even a good pair of binoculars. And at the moment, Venus is a very brilliant object in the eastern sky before dawn, so do go and have a look at it tomorrow morning if it's clear. So those are some of the things you can do and some of the things you can't do. Things like dark sky observation are out, the sun is in, the moon and planets, well, you can see something. I'm afraid that shielding artificial lights is very much of a problem. So the real answer is get away from them and take your telescope away into the darkness of the country sky. And there you'll be able to use it to the full. Well, obviously, big telescopes are not portable. Here's my 15 inch, my observatory in Sochi, and you certainly can't move that around. But other telescopes you can. This, for example, is my portable three inch refractor. No problem there. Here is a six inch Newtonian. That could go into a car. A folded telescope, that's a small one, but bigger folded telescopes can be taken around. And a Dobsonian on a very elementary kind of mounting, very easy indeed to take around. So it can be done, but mind you, even professional astronomers are having problems now. Look at this night picture of the Kitt Peak Solar Telescope in Arizona and all the light pollution in the background. It's a problem we've got to face. But don't despair, even if you do live in a the city, there's still plenty of it as you can see. If you want the latest information, don't forget, ring up our information line, 0898 And when I come back next month, I'll be joined by Dr. Chris Kitchen, and we'll be talking about those strange objects, the planetary nebulae. Until then, good night.